Good afternoon and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen and I'm the program manager for the center and will serve as your moderator today. We would like to extend a special thanks to Bob Hollis of the Mobius Network for providing the webinar management software for this series and Lisa Ruggiero of the National Recycling Coalition for providing technical support. Today's webinar focus is on food recovery and we have two excellent presenters today, Shannon Barbudo and Pete Pearson, who we'll introduce in a moment. Following their presentations, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment, please use the GoToWebinar dialog box located in the control panel on your screen. You may also use the dialog box to request assistance if you are experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. And now I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Shannon Barbudo. She recently became the regional food sourcer for Pennsylvania for Feeding America. By helping to provide food for over 37 million Americans every year, Feeding America is the nation's leading domestic hunger relief charity. Their mission is to feed America's hungry through a nationwide network of member food banks and engage our country in the fight to end hunger. Shannon has spent the past 17 years of her professional career in marketing and sales roles for food service and food sourcing organizations, creating sales plans and building relationships across the industry. Previously, Shannon was a director for food sourcing for City Harvest Inc. In that role, Shannon and her team procured 29 million pounds of food annually. As a regional food sourcer for Pennsylvania, Shannon will continue to bring her energy to secure product donations from food manufacturers within Pennsylvania in conjunction and collaboration with local Feeding America member food banks. Shannon is a graduate of Converse College with a BA in Political Science and Business Management. She put her interest in political science to work in 2007, serving as surrogate speaker and liaison in upstate New York for the Hillary Clinton for President campaign. And Shannon, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Wayne. As Wayne said, I am concentrating um, on feeding the hungry, primarily through food recovery. Currently in my role in Pennsylvania, I source fresh produce from the agriculture industry through large farms and wholesale produce companies. There's my presentation. Waste Not, Want Not, a new way to partner in waste reduction. So we've learned that there is a tremendous amount of food that goes to waste in the United States and that we can use this food to feed the hungry. This is a pyramid hierarchy put together by EPA, um, the Environmental Protection Agency, and it really shows you what we should be doing to eliminate food waste and keep it out of the landfill um, in order of importance. Um, of course, the first thing is to reduce the amount of food um, wasted, and companies now, manufacturers, are um, having tighter inventory controls and tighter ordering and buying um, to reduce the amount of waste before it's ever produced. Um, obviously, um, secondly, is to feed hungry people, to donate extra food to food banks, soup kitchens, and shelters. We are an organization uh, of 202 food banks across the United States. We're in every, we serve every county in the United States. And we do that through a very um, dedicated logistics team, many trucks on the road and uh, large warehouses, um, and then smaller entities, soup kitchens, um, and agencies that help us. And then I have found, um, I've been able to actually save food that um, is going to uh, hog feed that's feeding animals that can actually still be consumed by hungry people, um, but that is definitely next, is to feed um, animals on the farm and even zoos. 
um, can benefit from that. I'm not an expert in industrial uses, however I will touch on um, that waste oils and meat fats can go into um, industrial uses for making biofuels. The next is composting, which is wonderful to make um, valuable soil amendments. And um, across, across the spectrum, it just increases the health that your facility, when food waste um, is put in separated from your other trash. You know, it prevents rodents and insects, placing food scraps in closed, leak proof, durable containers um, to go to compost is um, just beneficial in so many ways. So and you can see over here the food weight in tons. I didn't touch on that, but I'm sure you guys saw it. Um, any food waste is any solid or liquid food substance, raw or cooked, which is discarded or intended or required to be discarded. Food waste are the organic residues generated by the processing, handling, storage, sale, preparation, cooking, and serving of foods. The scope is, is quite amazing. Um, 39.7 million tons we're at now, which is 79.4 billion pounds. Um, an example of a dent that we are making when I was um, with City Harvest and Food Rescue in New York City we were able to rescue 32, 39, now 42 million pounds of food a year. And that comes from every area of the food industry, from farms, from retail, groceries, from wholesale food wholesalers, and then down to restaurants, hospitals, universities, office cafeterias right down to where you're picking up maybe just a hundred pounds or even fifty pounds of food and that all adds up um, to be a lot of food that can feed and get out to feed a lot of people in a very short um, time turnaround. And this just shows you, um, you can see the different percentages of food waste and we haven't tackled residential waste yet, but you can see that um, in our own homes, 44%. I'm, I'm sure that that is something we are eventually, because hunger is such a huge problem that we are not um, going to see the end of hunger if we don't increase our food. So we are that we are in discussion about how to how to eliminate and reduce residential food waste. Um, service full service restaurants. It takes a lot of um, logistics and trucking to get to all the different restaurants to get the food um, that's being wasted where it needs to go, but it's not impossible. In many urban cities, there is food rescue at restaurant level and quick serve restaurants like um, McDonald's, those type of um, restaurants. Grocery stores has become a tremendous area for us of growth um, potential and we are capturing across um, many different uh, large grocery chains food that would otherwise go to waste and we're just so thankful and appreciative for, for those donors of food. Institutional, that's more like the schools and the hospitals. The growing, the economic impact, the growing processing and transporting food um, of which 25 to 40 percent is ultimately wasted. So you think about the food that goes to waste but everything that goes into getting that food harvested and to market um, just produced. Um, the fertilizer, the pesticides, the water, everything that goes into that, it's not just the end product. Manufacturer disposal expense, retailer shrink, disposal cost, um, obviously consumer out-of-pocket cost. Um, and more food reaches landfills and incinerators than any other single material in municipal solid waste. Um, and obviously we know that the methane produced by this food, I'm obviously not an expert on that, but um, the methane gas in landfills is what's creating 
21 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. And as I said before, the environmental impact, the energy, the water, the land use associated with food production of calories never consumed is just it's just such a waste and and I'm just so happy to see that there are so many organizations now that are uh, turning attention to this, including Feeding America. The greenhouse gas generation when food scraps degrade in landfills too. Obviously, I just talked about that. So the social impact, um, hunger. 50 million Americans have food insecurity. So what that means is 50 million Americans may not um, every day, every single day be hungry, but they find themselves um, during a period of a month not knowing, you know, how they're going to put food on the table, needing to go to a food pantry um, to find food. Um, and uh, they just, children especially don't have enough nutritious calories um, to grow and we're not, and we're not feeding our children. We have 16 million children in the U.S. that don't know where their next meal is coming from. So right now, actually, the EPA and Feeding America have joined for a three-year initiative, um, just cross-industry effort. All the different um, food industries that I've talked about, the retail sector, the wholesalers, the growers, the shippers, um, with two goals, to reduce food waste to landfill and to increase food to food banks by reallocating the waste. So food waste is a bigger issue than packaging waste. Um, packaging waste is a tremendous uh, part of that. This really is an interesting, it shows you the breakdown with the food scraps. Food that's probably, most of that is still food safe. They can still be passed on to a food bank, a food pantry. 21%, and then you see it broken down by yard trimmings at 8%, um, paper and paperboard 16%, plastic 17% all the way around, um, but you can see the food portion is large, the largest, and we can definitely tackle that, and we are. These are a lot of our partners, and we have Super Value, Pete, that's going to go on after me such a tremendous partner to us, but um, a lot of the large manufacturers, the Sara Lee, the Campbells, not only are they helping us um, donating product that may be short dated, that may have been mislabeled, that they can't sell, um, product that maybe was just mixed with too much salt or too much this um, the recipe just got off, but it's still perfectly great food. So not only are they donating trailer loads of this type of food, they are providing us with funding to run the trucks that pick the food up from the manufacturer, the retailer, and actually gets it to those in need, to the client. So we raise money to do that through um, individuals and through corporations. And the food industry um, has definitely stepped up to the plate to help us with that. Help your company, help your community. And um, Pete will go into more of this. He's really on the ground floor with um, how you can go about um, transitioning from a company who has food waste to one that really tackles cutting down on the food waste. Involve team members in identifying where edible product is going into waste stream. Create a process to donate. Um, people really have, they, they get enthusiastic about it. They create um, a team in the store at retail level that is responsible for collecting the food, making sure it gets put in a safe place and saved for when the food bank truck comes. Um, people feel good about this. You know, it helps morale. They're helping their community. And I can tell you, if you work in the food industry, the last thing you want to see is food going to waste, especially when you know there are people in the community that can use it. 
Um, it tracks you track savings for the company and you celebrate the success and uh, knowing that you're helping your neighbors in need. And once a product is deemed unsellable, um, it's important that the restaurant or the um, the cafeteria or the retailer or the wholesaler that they act quickly because it may only have a week on it. It may have less than a week of life on it, especially if it's fresh produce and to get it out and, and used by um, someone in need is, is important not to let it sit and, and just to be act quickly on that. Um, provides maximum tax benefit for your company. Um, CPAs, tax accountants are very tax professionals are very up to date now on um, what you can do to write off tax or donations of food. Provides maximum product life for clients to consume. Making the best use of reallocated food, feeding our neighbors, some of the people we serve. The problem is severe, the urgency is acute. 50 million people are food insecure in our country, in the United States. Limited or uncertain availability. That's one in six Americans. The driving force is unemployment. One in five under the age of 18 children, nearly 17 million children, don't have access to enough nutritious food to learn, grow, or thrive. Um, and I won't go into this too much because this um, webinar is on saving food from landfill and not poverty and the reason we need, but it definitely hits home um, to show you that, you know, unemployment's up, need, of food, need for food assistance is up, um, there's a lot of cuts at the federal level to get food um, to people in need and less available food. Um, in the manufacturing industry. Um, manufacturers are getting, which they should, they should, they absolutely should, should, are cutting back on overproduction. They have tight inventory control. So where it's overproduction, we used to get that food um, in food banking. Those are, t that's tighter streams now of, of flow. So we work now with farms and, and places that we haven't necessarily looked before for food waste which is great because it is keeping it out of the landfill. Feeding America, business partner in waste reduction. As I showed, all the different companies that we partner with across the nation. And that's just us, 202 community food banks, 61,000 agencies. Agencies are like your shelter, or your food pantry, or your soup kitchen. 37 million Americans served. And we currently are at 3.3 billion pounds of food served every year. Uh, we want to get to 5 billion in the next three years. We want to hit that, and we are going to do that through continuing um, to build retail food, saving retail food waste, and also agriculture through um, food that goes unharvested because um, it's it's overproduced, it did not get harvested, there wasn't um, monies to harvest it, um, or goes unsold after it's harvested at grower level. How, this is interesting, this is how our network works. So our donors, um, and this is food that would go in landfill. So from growers, processors, restaurants, manufacturers, distributors, retailers, convenience stores, wholesalers, food industry associations, food service operators, food drives. Now food drives um, is something that's, that a person, generally the consumer, is going and buying from a grocery store and then taking it to a food drive, whether it be at a school or at their company doing a food drive. So that's not necessarily food waste, but it is um, a small amount of where we get some food from. And then the USDA, there is a program called TFAP where the USDA, for example, um, when we had a drought this year um, across the nation and the farmers were suffering so much um, because of drought, USDA purchased potatoes to give to food banks and that helped the farms and it helped feed the hungry. 
Feeding America Network, um, we use the latest technology. We have GPS systems for our trucking. Um, and we use partners in logistics, um, logistics companies to help us get trailer loads of food from one side of the country to another. When there's an excess of citrus or plums in California, we will move that product where it needs to go to the middle of the country or even um, to the East Coast. Um, option. Um, sometimes we um, agencies help us. Like we don't have enough trucks ourselves, so we get our soup kitchens directly, um, volunteers even to pick up at a retailer like a Walmart. And our agencies are the food pantries, and as you can see down the list, there are senior centers, daycare centers, homeless shelters. Um, 37 million hungry Americans, um, victims of disaster. We're very active right now with Hurricane Sandy relief, um, getting food where it's needed, where people's, um, maybe the store in their area where they used to buy food was flooded and they have no access. And this is just our collection and distribution network that we're serving 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. And this is sort of backing up. Um, food safety comes first. So after all this is said, um, not everything can be saved. There are some times when the food is not safe and does need to be um, disposed of, discarded. Um, we practice serve safe and all the Board of Health um, regulations if food has been held out of time and temperature. Um, or if it's been improperly handled, any for any um, number of reasons, the food could be deemed unsafe. We serve people with compromised immune systems, oftentimes in the elderly and children. We would never, just for the sake of saving food, uh, want to take a risk. So, um, very important. Um, we practice serve safe at all of our warehouses and from beginning to end of the chain. And with that, um, because um, we are so careful with food safety. We feel very good about the federal law, the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act. This is a federal law that protects those that donate food to a nonprofit organization from civil or criminal liability. Um, and this is a, this will be this is usually the number one objection is liability. Companies are afraid to donate. Um, not so much anymore. They're coming um, to really believe in it and, and feel good about the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act. Um, but as long as you're giving in good faith, um, you will not be held liable if someone were to get sick from anything that was donated. Next slide. And these are all the benefits, which I'm sure that Pete will get into, an inventory management solution potential tax benefits, security and integrity of your brand, savings and storage and transportation. Um, to dump a tractor trailer load can be up to $4,000 at the landfill. Cost-free way to handle and sellable product, support sustainability commitments, um, and then we have sophisticated tracking and reporting and recall procedures. Um, we make it very easy um, to keep up with how many pounds you donated for your tax reporting um, and we have very sophisticated recall procedures as well. Product donation opportunities, you can just see here all the different um, types of food um, that we can take. Food, um, oftentimes people want to donate food that's been on a salad bar or um, hot soup that's a food that's still warm from a um, buffet. The food needs to have never been exposed to the elements where um, let's say you're on a salad bar and someone could have contaminated that. That cannot be donated and product that is still hot, um, it needs to be chilled properly according to ServeSafe. But most every, most everything can be donated. A lot of times manufacturers will be testing product um, and that can be donated. Um, sometimes 
there are cans that don't have labels. We have volunteers that will come in. We call those cans brights, those large cans of, of food. And volunteers will um, relabel properly that product so that it can still be used. This is just more um, examples. Underweight product, let's say the box um, was an ounce short of, you know, just a mistake, just an error. Bulk ingredients. I mean, we can take 50 pound bags of flour. We have, you know, large soup kitchens that bake, you know, bread. And there's just about anything that is produced we can take. We will figure out how to repackage it um, or relabel it. And that's why it matters because we're helping. We're helping take care of the next generation. And this um, lady, if you want to take down her name, she is the Director of Manufacturing and Partnerships. I think if you wanted to become a large-scale manufacturing <coughs> Um, donor um, somewhere in the United States. I'm currently handling um, agriculture and you would contact me if you are um, wanting to get involved with donation of fresh produce. But Karen Hanner is our Director of Manufacturing Partnerships at khanner at feedingamerica.org. And I would love questions. Are we going to go into Pete's, Wayne, or have questions for myself first. Yes, we're going to go on to Pete and then we'll we'll answer questions. Uh, thank you, Shannon, for that excellent presentation. Thank you. Our next presenter is Pete Pearson as Director of Sustainability and, and National Accounts. Pete Pearson is responsible for sustainability strategy and execution for all super value banners. He is also responsible for retail waste management, recycling, light maintenance, and janitorial services. Pete has 10 years experience as an operation analyst and project manager with various companies, including Hewlett Packard, Accenture, and SuperValue. Pete received a BS in business information systems from the University of Idaho and obtained his MBA in sustainable business management from Green Mountain College in Vermont. Pete has dedicated research into analyzing food supply chain challenges stemming from rising transportation costs and natural resource scarcity. One goal is to create an effective logistics program through which grocery stores can more efficiently source fresh food from local farmers and develop closed loop waste cycles. SuperValue, together with its subsidiaries, operates retail food stores in the United States. They operate 2,349 traditional and hard discount retail food stores, including 855 licensed Save-A-Lot stores. The company also offers supply chain services, which include wholesale distribution of products to independent retailers, including single and multiple grocery store, independent operators, regional and national chains, mass merchants, and military customers. The company was founded in 1871 and is based in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. And Pete, I'll hand it over to you. All right, perfect. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, thank you for letting me be here today and talk about something I'm personally just really passionate about, and I like to open it up uh, with just a why sustainability kind of topic, and, and, and what is my job, and I, I get this a lot, you know, what does the director of sustainability do, and I, I love this question because I also get a lot of nicknames, and my current favorite is corporate hippie, which I take just, I, I love it, I love being part of this, but part of my job, I view, is to look at business in a broader context to look at it in a global uh, social context and an ecosystem network context. And uh, it's something we, we have some definite issues. I just like to highlight some of this broader context. And one of the biggest is human consumption is outpacing the biocapacity of the planet. And, and put simply, that means the planet is not able to regenerate resources to feed our consumption habits. Anybody that has an elementary degree in, in <laughs> finances knows that's not a good place to be in, right? You also have 30% global decline in biodiversity since 1970. 75% of the marine fish stocks are fully exploited or overfished. 
and according to the 2010 data from the EPA, only 35% of everything we throw in the garbage gets recycled in the United States. Now talking specifically about food on the next slide, <clears throat> we have some fundamental problems here too. Um, based on global population and consumption, we need to try to double food production globally by 2050. Um, all of us know about carbon imbalances and climate change, but what you might not know is that if you look at the two together, the nitrogen cycle imbalances on our planet are actually more out of whack than carbon right now. And this is due to our, how we farm, the nitrogen inputs we put into agriculture, and how it eventually goes into a lot of our waterways and into the ocean. Water shortages globally are increasing. And the big thing, I, I think retailers are in a great position to spread awareness with consumers on what this means to them, what it means on the shelves, and, and what we need to change. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, this, is, this is part of my job. This is me right here. Uh, this is part of what I do is, is I am the trash man. I know what's in our garbage at all of our retail locations. And we're really trying to heighten awareness on what we throw away. This shows, uh, we, we, Wayne, in, in the introduction, talked about who super value is, and, and this is who we are. We are Albertsons in the West, right? We are Cub Foods in Minneapolis and Hornbachers. And in the Midwest, it's Shop and Save, Jewel Osco in Chicago, Save-A-Lot stores all over the United States. Uh, in the East Coast, in the Northeast, it's Shaw's and Star Market, Acme Market, Shoppers, Farm Fresh. Right. These are the brands that our consumers interact with, and that's who Super Value is. And this is who we represent, all the, gro all the grocery stores. In terms of our sustainability program, these are some accomplishments that I always love telling people about. And when we talk specifically about our zero waste program, um, you know, these are the things that we're really proud of. Uh, our zero waste culture has been building over the last, I'd say, four years. Um, last year, because of our recycling efforts, we were able to make $34 million in revenue on cardboard. We were able to make $3.2 million in plastic. That's just soft plastic income. $3.4 million in reduced annual waste hauling expenses. So this is the, the bill we get from the trash companies to haul our waste. That's going down. 50 million meals to food banks through Feeding America. And we have some other partners that we work with outside of Feeding America, so this is somewhat conservative. I mean, it's probably 55, 57 million meals total. And then if we look at our deferred tax benefit for Fresh Rescue, 10.8 million last year. This year we're keeping this going. We have 147 stores that we have recognized at diverting over 90% of their landfill waste. So, I mean, think about that for a sec. We've taken some of these stores, and we are now saying that 90% of what they used to dump into a hole in the ground is going to secondary use, being diverted in one way or the other. Um, four distribution centers also recognized under our zero waste program, 90% diversion or better. 700 plus stores with organic diversion programs. This is one I love to talk about because I'm not talking about fresh rescue. Every single one of our stores has a fresh rescue or a food bank donation program. This is stores that are, that are utilizing composting or some type of organic waste diversion method. And that's of the 1,100 stores that we own directly, 700 have these programs in place. And that is just amazing. I think we've, we've seen this jump um, hugely just in the last two years. What this has also done, I mean, we started this journey talking about zero waste in the context of the things that we put in the trash. And I'd say over the last year or two, it started to evolve into a broader definition of what zero waste means to our culture as a company. And really, when you get down to it, it's zero waste to landfill. It should be zero waste of energy, right? Let's start taking a look really closely at how much, what, our, what kind of lighting we have, what kind of usage of electricity we have, and let's have zero waste policy on electricity. And now we're shifting it also to water, right? All three of these things 
as a cultural component. They're going to save you money, I guarantee that. But it's also a tremendous help to the environment and, and social uh, to be doing these things. And it, it's, it, it's been met with amazing responses in our company. Um, for me, you know, as I've done a lot of research, it's, it's things fundamentally shifted when people in Boston wanted to have a California salad in the middle of winter, right? And so 100 years ago, this is how it started. It started with refrigerated lines. The next slide will show some guys filling up. The, 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 this is how they did refrigeration back in the old days. They filled these compartments with ice, and off it went to Boston with a fresh salad. And, and, and the symbol of all this has been the perfect tomato, which is on the next slide. Um, Grocery stores and our culture, I mean, this is what we're after. We're after the perfect everything when you go into a grocery store. And it's, it's great. My, my grandmother used to talk about this all the time. She was amazed before she passed away at walking in the grocery store, and she would just see nothing but perfect produce. And this is something relatively new. This is in my lifetime. I take it for granted. But what this leads to is tremendous amounts of waste. And Shannon talked about it up front. And we've, we've looked at all the statistics, so I won't go into that detail. But because we want perfect, it means there's a huge opportunity to try to recover and to save what is wasted or what's deemed not perfect. What it's focused us to do as a business, or, or what it's caused us to do as a business, is to know your trash. It's really that simple. Um, I'm amazed more and more as I go to each individual store, it's the same story every time. We have the same things in the garbage. And I would challenge any business operator, any, 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 uh, any person even at home, to just spend some time and sort out what you got in the garbage every week. Um, for us, in a grocery store, it's a lot of cardboard. Right? We get a lot of boxes of things that come through the store. And most of the pallets that we receive off trucks they're full of cardboard boxes and shrink wrap. So that's your cardboard, your hard plastic, and your soft plastic. Some things come in wax cardboard. Um, you have edible and non-edible food, too. In, in, a, in a lot of cases, food represents about 40% of our garbage in a grocery store. And it's either food that um, we can no longer sell or it's food that we can sell to food banks, or not sell to food banks. We can donate to food banks. <clears throat> so right now we have, in all of our banners, we have a, a zero waste leader who is responsible for kind of the feet on the street and, and really driving what we call our zero waste imperatives, the things that each store should be focusing on um, every day. And one of them is to just make sure that your trash service fits um, how much trash you're generating. You'd be surprised. And a lot of businesses, I think, have this idea that trash is a fixed cost and that you just pay it every month. But if you go out and actually start looking at your garbage every once in a while, you might see that you're only filling your dumpster half full, right? And so why not get a smaller dumpster? You're going to pay less money. And, you know, it helps the bottom line a little bit. But we also try to maximize all our recycling income. So really try to get the maximum revenue potential out of things we know we can collect and sort at the stores, and that's cardboard, plastics, and paper. We're also you know, involved constantly with researching area and community composting operations or um, hog farmers in the Northeast or wherever they might be, and trying to find the value in organic waste diverted out of the landfills, because there's no reason why all this food waste should be going to landfills. Constantly improve the fresh rescue program. So again, all of our stores have relationships with food banks, but it's it's keeping and developing that training with our store associates and making sure that they are donating whenever possible and making sure that it is going to feed somebody first before it goes down on the on the, uh, the food hierarchy. And then the last thing is awareness and incentives. Um, just making sure that we're constantly talking to stores about what the potential is. And then we have a, a, a humble incentive program where when a store has achieved you know, that zero waste threshold of 90% diversion, they get a great plaque and they get some incentives and rewards uh, to their store. 
Uh, this just shows what some of the numbers uh, have been over the last four years for super value. So this is taking into account all of the waste and recycling um, financials over the past four years. And you can see the blue bars, if you're to look at the blue bars, it's a pretty steady decline in our waste expenses. We continually, as we divert more and more away from the landfills and as we right size our um, waste services, whether you're getting the compactor picked up or whether you have routed bin service that you get to knock one day a week off of because you don't generate as much garbage, this means our waste expenses go down. Great for the business, right? We don't have to spend as much money sending stuff to a hole in the ground. But what it also does is the green bars represent our recycling income. And as you start diverting more of this away with the intention to, to sell it when you can, then again, we're making the most money right now off cardboard and soft plastics and plastics. But I can, I can honestly see the day when um, unedible food waste will be a commodity just like cardboard. I see the day when we might be selling our food waste to people who are trying to create energy from that food waste or who are really taking composting to the next level and making designer composts for certain types of crops, right? feeding that back into our soils. So what we're starting to realize all the way from our CEO all the way down is that what, what we have in the trash can is money. It's a valuable commodity, and in most cases, we can get a cost-neutral diversion on it, or we can make money on it, whereas before, we were paying somebody to haul it away. It's, a, it's an amazing time to be doing this kind of work because things are fundamentally shifting in, in terms of how we perceive how we move forward with it. <clears throat> I just wanted to highlight one example, too. Um, this is an example. I live in Boise, Idaho, and um, we have 20 Albertson stores in this area we call the Treasure Valley. I mean, it's it's a, a small little pocket of the world, and we just did a quick little test. This is super conservative on the numbers. We, we're saying a store's average organic waste per day was about 200 pounds. You take that times, you know, how many how many stores we have in the network, and we worked out a total that annually we're sending to the Ada County, Ada County landfill about a million and a half pounds of food waste every year. And then I took parity. I said, okay, there's roughly 64 grocery stores. And, you know, depending on the size and how much sales volume they do, it's probably plus or minus what we have. And I think this is super conservative, by the way you're probably looking at between five and seven million pounds of food waste going into a hole in the ground every year. And to me, this is, this is crazy because this stuff has value. If anything, this should be going into composting operations and should be feeding the soils and the agriculture around in this area. But the great news is, is that in communities all across the country, this is changing, right? They're starting to realize that this is not the way we should do business and we should capture the added value this material has. So just a quick snapshot on what it looks like just in one community with a handful of stores. <clears throat> I think it's important, um, we, you know, Shannon mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of partnership opportunities. She represents uh, Feeding America, and I just wanted to highlight why I think it's important to have these critical and legitimate partners. Um, one of the philosophies we've had for a long time is we want to make sure that when we're donating food as a grocery store to a food bank, um, we, don't, we don't want to discriminate. We want to help people, right? But there are some things that you really need to watch out for if you do decide to do this. The one thing Feed America gives you is you know, access to data and reporting and really gives you know, a company our, side, our size sorry, the ability to understand how much we're doing and what impact we're having. So data and reporting is a big deal for us. But what they also have is a good traceability program and a process that they make sure food banks are using to ensure the two big things, which is food safety and the ethical handling of the products that are donated. 
unfortunately, I mean, there's some that, that can take advantage of this type of a program. And we've had instances where we're donating to an agency and they're selling it on the corner and making some money off it. And that's not what we're intending to do with this product, right? This product is, is meant to go to feed hungry people. Um, the other thing is, is food safety, and Shannon talked about it a lot. Um, it's, it's really important that these things are handled properly, that there's the proper cold chain for any products moving through the system, and uh, we take it very seriously. So again, having these partnerships like Feeding America is critical. And then from an incentive standpoint, being part of the EPA Food Recovery Challenge I think is great because it kind of adds this competitive fun element to it. And again, it really helps to understand what kind of impact we're making through, through the data and the reporting that we're getting through the program. Uh, something I, want, I added a little late, and this is really fun to me because this, this just happened this year. And again, uh, Shannon mentioned this is, this is a big part of her job is to look at agricultural surpluses and the things that are happening bef before it even hits the shelves in a grocery store. So what we did is we teamed up with um, several companies in Minneapolis this fall, uh, Seneca, General Mills, Cargill, Second Harvest, Heartland just to name a few, and we made the commitment to try to save corn from, from the fields. Um, a lot of people might not know this, but what happens is, you know, you can never predict Mother Nature, and each year when, when the corn is harvested, it comes to a, a, a plant where a general mills wants to make green giant corn. They want to can corn or they want to freeze corn. And what happens is you get so much push from agriculture to feed it into this processing system, and what happens is you run out of capacity, right? You're not able to process enough corn quickly enough, and you just can't keep the corn. It'll spoil eventually. And so what happens is a lot of that just gets left in the field. It's called agricultural surplus. So this group took it upon ourselves to pilot a program where we're going to try to save as much as we can. So what happened is we brought it to a staging facility, and then super value, we were able to donate volunteer time in our trucks where we would load it on the trucks. The trucks are refrigerated, so we bring it down to temperature, ensuring that safe and, and, and food safety in a cold chain that's, that's compliant with, with food safety standards. And then we were able to ship that to Second Harvest for distribution to, I think it went to 10 states. And when all was said and done, over the course of three or four weeks, we had 600,000 pounds of corn that we saved, represented 465,000 meals, right? And this is just one place. This is Minneapolis, one place, three, four weeks out of one year, and one product. We might have been able to do this for peas and, and who knows what else, right? But the numbers to me were just staggering. I, I mean, this, this is something that's happened probably every year to have this kind of surplus. And it just is, there's traditionally been nothing to do with it. So we're starting to prove these models to where it can be saved, it can be harvested, and it can go to a great use. So I'd like to wrap up my presentations when I can with just some kind of words of wisdom and and um, this is a really great book I mean for anybody that's interested in this whole idea of waste cycles and, and how do we you know, you know not have food waste all these things buy the book Cradle or Cradle one it's it's plastic waterproof you can read it in the hot tub if you want but I always love this line we begin to make human systems and industries fitting when we recognize that all sustainability is local we need to recognize interdependence, the interdependence that we have between each other. And the elements of human design are entwined and depend upon the natural world. I am a, a strong believer that we can have a world of zero waste, we're, and we're starting to push the, the edges of this and, and changing people's minds about you know, how they go to business and what we do waste. We still live on a world of abundance and biodiversity. And even with all the doomsday predictions, I think we can still turn it around. And when you get down to it, the things that are most important, it's not iPods and iPads, it's clean air, 
clean water and abundant food. And I think if we stay laser focused on that as a culture and as a businesses and as individuals, I think we got some great some great things ahead and a great future. So that's it. All right, thank you, Pete. Again, a, an excellent presentation. Uh, and again, uh, thank you, Shannon. We're now gonna field some questions for our presenters. Again, if you have a question, please enter them into go to webinar dialog box. Uh, we do have some questions on uh, already. So I'll start with the first one. And I believe this one goes to Pete. What are retailer shrink costs? What are retail shrink costs? So a retail shrink is, is anything that you, you, you can't sell and it's, it's, it's product you lose, right? It's, it's either you know, something you have on the shelf that you're just not able to sell. And so one of the things that we've learned is that by, by tracking all of our food waste, whether it's going to a donation facility or a, you know, a food pantry, or by understanding how much volume went to a composting operation, we're able to get better information on shrink, right? Because we're analyzing the entire spectrum of shrink and everything that we're not selling. So it's actually done us a great service by looking at it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shannon, I believe this is, a, this is a question for you. Do you charge food pantries for your food? That is something decided by each and every food bank individually. Um, at feeding our City Harvest, when I was the director of food sourcing, every single um, food, every amount of food, every delivery was completely free of charge. Um, I'm not sure the, sometimes they just buy, sometimes the component of food banking is purchased. It is a purchase system where they'll purchase so much that they can pass on those savings to food pantries. Let's say they pack, you know, three trailer loads of canned peas and they get such a reduced rate that they just save the agency's um, money but do pass on um, some minor fees some food banks do for um, delivery or if they had, if it was a purchase instead of a pure donation. Produce, however, is delivered completely um, with no charge. Okay. Pete, do you have anything to add? That's all I have to add. No, nothing for me to add to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, I believe it could be answered by both. When you move food, is it only by truck or do you avail yourself to the rail system or consignment groups? Um, there is an organization called Move for Hunger that has helped us. It's a moving company. They help us. Mm. Um, we are Railex as a partner working um, to move product from one side of the country to another using rail. Um, but mostly it is, it is trucks. Majority is trucks. But we are open to other ways, definitely. Yeah, and I know a lot of retailers, it, it could be trucks of any size, so it's not just you know big semis. It could be just little short haul urban or community-based trucking routes. And I know a lot of retailers, including Super Value and, and others, you know, they donate money to food banks to be able to purchase trucks that can that can move food in communities and uh, also pay for drivers. I mean, when you donate money to a food bank, in a lot of cases, it's, it's not always going to just purchasing food, but it's also paying people to help go collect it, right? That's, that's a big, big thing. Okay. Next question, I believe is for Pete. Please clarify landfill diversion versus total diversion. This term generally allows incineration, which is not a zero waste practice. And I believe there's a follow-up question on uh, how much waste do you incinerate versus landfill? Yeah, I don't have the exact number. I, we, we do not say that our diversion, if we're incinerated, it doesn't count as our diversion. So let's say a store was at 90% diversion. None of that 90% would be incineration. We don't count that. So it's a great question, great call out. Um, and, and did I answer it fully though, Wayne? I, can you reread it again? Uh, let me get back to it quick here. Um, okay. 
Yeah, they just want to clarify diversion versus total diversion. Yeah, it's not included in our diversion when we when we are recognizing a store. Okay. This question is for Pete again. Of the 147 stores recognized as zero waste, are the names slash locations of those stores available? This person is curious uh, for good business examples in his area. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, we try to do press releases on as many as we can. Uh, sometimes they just don't get picked up by the press though. I mean, we can put out press releases and, and make it known, um, but that's definitely something we, we could we could post or, or I could share with outside of this meeting in this webinar okay and uh, well there was an email uh, a question I saw later uh, would you give out your email address if you want to do that now that would be fine sure uh, how many people do we got on the call <laughs> <laughs> 149 <laughs> uh, that's that's easy okay that's it's it's really simple Pete dot Pearson at supervalue.com and it's P-E-A-R-S-O-N. Okay, this question is for Shannon. If there are 50 million food insecure people in this United States today, what has that number been historically? It's gradually risen. The last statistic was 47 million. I think that was 2009. Um, Prior to that, I'm not sure the exact statistic, but it, it has um, not dropped okay. in many years. Okay. Uh, question for Pete. Do you include employee impact on sustainability in their job evaluations? And if so, how? Uh, we don't. It's not a formal piece of our performance reviews every year for, for every associate across the company. But I will say that when we talk about our zero waste program, especially zero waste of energy, zero waste to landfill, I mean, this is something that, you know, I, I think in a majority of the stores, you can walk in and talk to associates and they would tell you that it's, it's something they're working on and something that's a big deal to a lot of people. So not formally part of the performance reviews. I would love to see an element of that in our performance reviews, mm -hmm. but it's not currently. Okay. This question is for Shannon. How is the food bank industry working with grocers and farmers to get more fresh food instead of packaged slash processed food to underserved populations and children? Um, well, not just populations um, of children, um, although we do direct food to after school programs and do have um, training or just sort of teaching children what food, you know, what different food items are that, you know, like what's a pineapple and let's you know, where does it come from? And so we do education like that for children and we do um, programs where we send food home on the weekend on Friday that's now starting to be produce that we send home in a backpack or a bag with children for the weekend. So we are um, getting a lot more fresh food out. But how we do this um, is we are growing our, our team in produce at Feeding America with people such as myself, regional produce sourcers. And we started with a gentleman in New York State three years ago um, to directly work in the ag industry. And now we have myself in Pennsylvania. We have um, an individual in Wisconsin. We just brought on Texas, Florida, Arizona, Idaho, and we're looking to add um, a person in North Carolina soon in Georgia. I think we have 13 um, individuals on on Mark to just focus on um, produce, fresh produce. So that is how we are going to get to our next um, 2 billion pounds of food. Yeah, the one thing I, I do want to add too, when you talk about retail, this, this is a really, it's a great question and it gets super tricky because on one hand, a retailer in a grocery store is trying to sell food. That's how we make money, right, as a business. And on the other hand, we're giving it away when we can't sell it. <clears throat> and what happens is with, with with certain things like dairy products that are just outdated, that there's a 
a period of time when you can still donate it, it's still safe, but it's just expired the, the expiration date, right? So that's, that's easy. Produce is a bit more difficult because what we like to do is to discount it down um, when it starts getting older and trying to still sell it and really walk that line of when we can and can't sell it. And then by the time it's unsellable, what happens is you have to have it picked up almost every single day by the food bank or else it's going to completely spoil and it's unedible. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of places, you just don't have that everyday routed service to the grocery store. And that's the fine line you always walk. You know, you want to do the right thing. You want to donate it, but you also want to sell it when you can. And for produce, it just it's a really fine line to walk. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest opportunities is like, with the agriculture surpluses and and working with farmers directly um, before it even hits the shelves or if, if you are, are knowing that you're not going to be able to even sell it. So. Okay, thank you. A question for Pete and maybe Shannon can, can also uh, contribute. Uh, do you find other major grocer chains also working on sustainability or super value of Pioneer? Are there any European models you follow? Uh, your, their European models galore for sure. I think the U.S. is always, you know, learning a lot from Europe, and and you know, geographically, Europe has more to deal with, right? They they have less land, and when their landfills fill up, they got to deal with this problem because it's real. For us in the U.S., we're just we're blessed with a lot of things, a lot of resources. Um, but you know, we are not the only retailer, uh, especially grocery retail, dealing with sustainability and working through it. Um, I'd say that we are doing a, an amazing job in terms of zero waste in the programs we have but you know you look at Kroger and Safeway and Walmart and you know even even some smaller ones Whole Foods obviously I mean each one kind of has the things that they're doing really well and that they're leaders in and I think we're all it's a really fun time because a lot of us are collaborating together and it's not so much of this competitive element but it's really just coming together and finding these solutions that make sense and then um, seeing what we can do about these problems. That's great. That's, I would agree with Pete on that. That is, um, they're collaborating. I would say just about every retailer chain now is focused in some way on saving food um, for food rescue and then many are developing composting programs to but um, we do a good job. We need the food so badly at Feeding America that we are knocking on doors. We are salespeople for food rescue. So if they don't call us, we will be calling them. And um, we raise money to grow our truck fleet. Um, and our goal would be to have a truck show up at every grocery store every day so that produce does not you know, have to go to waste. So it gets out same day would be the ultimate goal, picked up and delivered same day. It takes money, but um, that would be our goal, definitely. Okay, question for Shannon. Who is the retail contact at Feeding America? Uh, the retail, director of retail is Eric Davis. Um, e. Davis at feedingamerica.org. He handles part of the country, and Diane Letson handles um, Atlanta and up the East Coast. Eric handles the Western part. Um, Diane is D L E T S O N at feedingamerica.org. Thank you. This uh, this next one's more of a comment than a question. It seems like expiration dates are scaring people into discarding food products too early when the item isn't necessarily at the point of being unhealthy or untasty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a big education piece that we do and I'm sure that um, to, that Pete does on his end to educate um, the employees not to throw it away. It's still good. Um, we follow guidelines, um, federal guidelines of the extension that products have. Like a can, a can has two years after the mark, the date on the can and obviously things like chips and crackers. Um, it's mostly a quality issue. It's just not its best fresh quality, but it's still food safe. So we, it's really an education piece. 
Here's a good one for Pete. Instead of the recycling revenue focus, would it be better to look at reuse packaging and containers with back shipping options? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm a, a huge fan of uh, reusable plastic containers for a lot of our produce. So instead of a farmer putting their strawberries or, or whatever it might be into a, a cardboard box or a plastic container, put it in a reusable container, right? <clears throat> you know, there's some there's some growing pains in doing that on the fields and in the transportation cycle. But again, what we're seeing is great benefits even when it's on the shelf. You, you have better airflow when it's in the refrigerated cases. Uh, the products can last longer. And you're, and you're getting that reusable component. You're not having to send anything to waste or recycle it because it's totally reusable. Now, I will say the interesting thing that's happened is in some cases, uh, when you, when you shift to a reusable plastic container, people really get, uh, they, they like the revenue that we're generating from cardboard. So on one side, you're making all this money on cardboard and you're able to sell it. Um, and if you switch to RPCs, you might put a dent in the cardboard recycling revenue. But, you know, it's, it's the better thing to do and, and a lower cost overall to go with reusable plastic containers. And it's something that we're, that we're also involved with right now. And I would just add to that, in the agriculture, at the grower level, um, watermelon bins, the cardboard bins are pretty expensive. They cost anywhere 12 to $15 per bin. And they are also going towards the um, large plastic farm bins or even wooden farm bins. And we arrange to pick up the bins, empty the produce, and then take it back to the farm. Okay, great. Next question for Pete. Do you compost meat and dairy or just fruit and vegetables at your stores? It's a great question. Uh, a lot of places don't allow it. So a lot of states have regulations to where you aren't allowed to compost meat and dairy as part of it. Um, the odd thing is that some states are. Uh, um, some places in the Midwest allow you to do it. And in those cases, we've experimented with it because it's it's a a simpler diversion option for the store, right? Instead of five things you have to divert, now the store can go down to maybe three or two. So it makes it really easier on store processes. Um, but it's something you really have to watch and you have to make sure that you're in compliance with state and local regulations before you do it um, because in some places you can't. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Uh, many states do allow composting of, of proteins, meat and, vet, and, uh, and fats. Uh, it depends on the type of composting technology used and size of, this, of the system. Uh, a lot the bigger systems that use aerated systems, for example, have really no problem with with composting meat and, and fats and, and the like. This question, I believe, is for Shannon. How does the Feeding America activities work with existing local grocery store recovery efforts? Examples, church members pick up dated baked goods and take to the local food bank or meal program. Um, so because of limited trucking and because in some areas the food bank may be, you know, as much as two hours from the grocery store and we may have 600 different agencies in our area, we will partner with an agency, and these are agencies that we um, visit frequently, we monitor their handling processes, we, ha we monitor their food safety, um, how they're distributing the food, and um, they have to be a part of us and to be labeled Feeding America, um, you know, have to follow certain guidelines. But we will partner to let, um, to get agencies to report poundage and pick up directly. Um, and we make sure that they have proper handling too. If they're picking up um, something that needs to, you know, be in a cold, um, we'll use cold blankets, freezer blanket blankets, or um, that sort of thing. If they're picking up in a van instead of a refrigerated truck, but we definitely count on um, to pick up at many different grocery stores. We count on our agencies directly. Hope that answered the question. Yep. Okay, I think we're out of our allotted time. Uh, again, thank you, Shannon and Pete, for these presentations and, and answering the questions. Uh, in closing, this webinar, like all the webinars in this series, have been recorded and uh, will be available on both the National Recycling Coalition 
and Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center websites. Uh, thank you again for joining us. We hope you will join us for next month's webinar scheduled for Tuesday, January 15th at 1.30 Eastern Time. And have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.